Um, uh, thanks so much um, for the opportunity to speak to you all. Can you hear me? Um, I apologize for my lack of French. Um, uh, so this is going to be about Uganda, as Mark said, and its role in the troubles in the Great Lakes and Horn of Africa since the end of the Cold War. Um, and it's particularly about the role of Yoweri Museveni, its longstanding enigmatic leader. In my country, the US, very few people even know who Museveni is. And of those who do, a great many consider him uh, a diplomatic, moderate force in a volatile region of the world. They may acknowledge the lack of democratic space in the country, uh, but consider this a small price to pay uh, for the stability and prosperity that has supposedly reigned in the country since Museveni took over. I hope to convince you that uh, Museveni is really a confidence man who has managed to seduce Western policymakers into assisting his ambitions in the region at enormous cost. Um, you all obviously know where Uganda is, but just in case, uh, voila. Um, and there's uh, Yoweri Museveni in his younger days when his rebel force, uh, the National Resistance Army, seized power in 1986. I've been fascinated by this man for decades. I used to be a biologist. And in um, 1993, I went to Uganda to work uh, for a company that was making uh, an AIDS vaccine. Our project failed, as you all know, there's still no AIDS vaccine, but I became fascinated by Uganda and its struggles. Over the years, I became aware of numerous corruption scandals, terrible human rights abuses, including massacres of civilians, uh, torture of political activists, journalists, and others, and even possible targeted killings of politicians and other prominent people. At the same time, I also became aware that Museveni's government was receiving um, um, up to, um, um, they had received billions of dollars in foreign aid from the OECD annually, as well as military support from the US and other Western countries. And I really wondered why more Western taxpayers weren't alarmed about this. Shortly after um, coming to power, Museveni quickly became one of America's closest military allies on the continent. Here he is with various US presidents over the years, um, in the late 1980s, he met with Ronald Reagan three times. I wasn't able to find out what was discussed, uh, but it's odd for such a young man in his 40s at the time, a professed communist as he was then, uh, who just shot his way to power to make so many high-level visits to Washington and even to Ronald Reagan's ranch. Um, Museveni even hired a public relations firm run by Ronald Reagan's son-in-law to buff up his reputation in Washington and smooth his way at the World Bank, which quickly began pouring uh, money into um, the country. Uh, as you can see, it increased quite rapidly uh, over the period that we've been discussing at this conference. Um, annual aid disbursements, uh, tripled during the late 1980s already from about 70 million to 200 million uh, per year, uh, shortly after the first Reagan meetings, those early meetings. Uh, during this time, Amnesty International was producing damning human rights reports about Uganda, especially in the north of the country, which saw unprovoked massacres of villagers by the army, torture, also the closing down of newspapers, the imprisonment of journalists and editors, and probable targeted killings. Uh, and yet, um, here's um, Museveni, for example, with uh, George H.W. Bush, the first George Bush, at New York's Waldorf Astoria. The date is worth noting. This is October 1st, 1990. Uh, during the UN meetings. That's, of course, the day that the RPF invaded Rwanda from Uganda. Uh, Museveni had that very morning reassured the international community that Uganda didn't approve of or support the invasion and would close the border at once 
and prevent any personnel or weapons from crossing um, or support of any kind. Uh, but he did not do any of those things. I have no evidence that Bush or any other US officials knew about the invasion in advance, but the picture is troubling, uh, as is the steady increase in aid, of course. Um, hang on a sec. How are we doing there? Oops. I wanted to go back. Uh, there we go. As is uh, the steady increase in aid after 1990. Um, the RPF soon set up bases inside Rwanda from which it launched attacks on civilians, as we've heard. Um, all the while, it was receiving assistance from Uganda right up to the genocide and even um, during the uh, crisis after April 6th. Um, during those years, Uganda would, also, would, be, would funnel weapons also at that time, uh, not just to Rwanda. Oops, okay, how are we going? Yeah, not just to Rwanda, uh, but also to rebels uh, to, in southern Sudan, the SPLA, uh, at the same time, beginning in around 1990, 1991, and then also um, helped organize the AFDL, which it invaded Zaire in 1996. And uh, Uganda, of course, would then invade Congo again in 1998. Um, so even at this early stage during the 1990s, Museveni was supporting three insurgencies at around the same time, um, and then uh, others later, some of which ended up fighting each other in Congo. Throughout these, uh, this period, human rights abuses inside Uganda continued, including election rigging, the forced eviction of more than a million people in northern and eastern Uganda from their land, uh, who were then herded into squalid camps where thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, died from hunger and starvation and were sitting ducks for attacks by Joseph Kony's Lord's Resistance Army. Um, go government soldiers seldom did anything to protect these people. Um, um, Museveni received not only aid during this period, but a constant stream of praise in international circles. In June 1994, while the Rwanda genocide raged, the University of Minnesota gave Museveni an honorary degree for diplomacy. In the late 1990s, Time magazine hailed him as a herdsman philosopher, and the New York Times even tentatively compared him to Nelson Mandela. For many years, I tried to understand these contradictions. But my, obtain, my attempts to obtain interviews with Washington officials who understood the situation went nowhere. If I did manage to get an interview with, with someone, I was told that the money we give to Uganda is strictly humanitarian pur for humanitarian purposes, mostly health programs. But when I pointed out that we also support the Uganda military and via US contributions to the World Bank, the rest of Museveni's budget, the interviews ended very quickly. Meanwhile, despite all the aid for health, Uganda's health system remained in utter shambles. Hang on a minute. Let's see. How's it going? Hold on. Is it going? Ah, it went. Oh, wait. Ah, OK, the, these are the northern Uganda IDP camps. Sorry. And here we have um, a health clinic. Um, uh, dilapidated health services, the clinics newly built very often, very quickly uh, invaded by bats and other wildlife, and some became sort of hideouts for thieves and so on because they were unoccupied uh, and certainly not delivering services. Here is um, also the, um, oh, it's over there. Oh, okay, gotcha, okay. Uh, also, this is the uh, maternity ward at Malago Hospital in Uganda, where maternity, um, I was actually told by a person who was working there um, in, since the 1970s, a doctor who was in charge of maternal health services there, that the death rate in, for mothers in Malago had increased sevenfold since the days of Idi Amin. Um, the, um, the reasons for these poor services is obvious. Museveni's henchmen and government um, have been stealing every shilling that isn't nailed down. According to one estimate, uh, some 
uh, $1.8 billion has been stolen over the years. Uh, this includes donor funds intended for AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, as well as children's vaccines, the reconstruction of the war-torn North refugees' hospitals, and other humanitarian projects. Um, nevertheless, uh, the World Bank has continued to lavish praise on, um, on Uganda as an economic success story, even though Uganda's children uh, are among the least likely in the world to, com uh, to complete oops, primary school. Uh, fewer than 20% of Ugandans have electricity. More than half live at least a 10-minute walk from the nearest water source. And only a third of Ugandans can afford three meals a day. The idea that I advance in my book, um, uh, Another Fine Mess, U um, America, Uganda, and the War on Terror, is that the mystery of America's infatuation with Museveni boils down to the War on Terror. Most people think America's War on Terror began in 2001, but it actually has roots much further back in time. During the 1970s and 80s, a growing uh, radical Islamist movement began to emerge in response to US support for Israel, for our entanglements with the Saudi Arabian leadership and other problems. Um, Museveni came to power three years before uh, the Berlin Wall fell. The Soviet Soviets were on the way out, of course, but this new threat, uh, which we now know as militant Islam, uh, loomed, and it was gaining strength in Sudan which is uh, Uganda's northern neighbor. Sudan had long been an ally of the West, but in the early 80s, uh, its leader, Gafar Nimieri, began linking up with radical Islamists, uh, like the vociferous cleric, um, Hassan Tarabi, who denounced Israel and went through the streets of Khartoum calling for a global caliphate. Back in Washington, this shift uh, was greeted with alarm. Then, in 1989, Omar Bashir, a mid-ranking army officer, took over in league with Tarabi, and they began welcoming uh, lots of scary people to Sudan, including Osama bin Laden, uh, members of Hamas and Hezbollah, and uh, Islamic Jihad. One U.S. diplomat at the time called Sudan a holiday inn for terrorists. Um, they were bent on toppling uh, America's then ally, Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, and undoing Egypt's peace deal with e e Israel, which Museveni, of course, wanted very much, I mean, which Washington, sorry, wanted very much to preserve. Um, Bashir eventually distanced himself from Tarabi, and in 1996, Sudan kicked Osama bin Laden, uh, kicked him out of the country. But Washington never trusted Bashir, and may well have exaggerated the Sudan threat, uh, much as it did the Iraq threat after 9-11. In 1993, the US linked Sudan to the first World Trade Center bombing, even though the evidence for, those, uh, for state complicity was not, uh, certainly not airtight. US operatives also linked Sudan to a host of other terror plots, including one to assassinate National Security Advisor Tony Lake, and blow up a party for children of diplomats in Khartoum, but these turned out to be uh, almost certainly hoaxes also. However, it is true that um, Islamic militants based in Sudan did try to assassinate Egyptian uh, leader Mubarak in 1995, and that certainly alarmed the Americans. So what's all this got to do with Uganda? I suspect that fears of Sudan's potential reach in Central Africa is what lay at the heart of Museveni's relationship with the United States. We know that Uganda had been a conduit for weapons from Israel to South Sudanese rebels in the 60s. We also know that his assistance resumed under Museveni in the 90s, this assistance to Southern Sudanese rebels, and that some of these weapons uh, were clandestine transferred from US stocks left over from the first Gulf War. We also know that in the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide, um, rebel groups hostile to Kagame and Museveni began camping out in eastern Zaire, and that Mobutu tolerated uh, their presence, and Bashir actively supported some of these groups. In other words, from the late 1980s, uh, an earthquake had really been um, building up in, um, hang on a sec, uh, 
uh, had really been building up. Um, um, in uh, Central Africa with uh, Uganda and Rwanda on one side and Zaire and Sudan on the other. At stake, we assume, was the great prize of unex um, unexploited uh, um, natural resources, including oil, gold, diamonds, the coltan for the soon-to-explode computer industry, cobalt, nickel, um, uh, uranium for bombs, iron, for everything, and so on. So what I think must have happened uh, is that the Americans and the British decided it was in their interest to support the Uganda-Rwanda axis in this deepening conflict. We know or have strong evidence to suspect that the US helped shape the valiant narrative about the RPF right from the start, supported the AFDL invasion of Zaire, and spent years covering up the massacres and other abuses carried out by Uganda and Rwanda inside Congo and in their own countries. Um, what I imagine their reasoning was is that Museveni and Kagame might well have been thugs, but they would rather they had control over this crucial region than uh, Mobutu and uh, Bashir did. Since 2000, Museveni has gone on to help stir up trouble in Somalia and South Sudan, and yet he's still praised by the UN and the European Union and others as a champion of refugees, even though many, if not most, of the Congolese and South Sudanese who have fled to Uganda were driven from their homes by Uganda's <coughs> own army or groups it supports. Um, it's a grim story, but brave Ugandans are trying to fight back. In recent years, a new spirit of resistance has, moved, has emerged in the country, although the regime is cracking down brutally, as usual. Um, um, in 2006, Ugandan soldiers gunned down around 150 unarmed people in western Uganda. The victims included 14 small children. Museveni then promoted the commander who led the assault. In 2017, Museveni's special forces raided parliament right in broad daylight, grabbed a particularly outspoken woman opposition MP, and uh, broke her spine, uh, crippling her. There she is uh, with a walker. Her name is Betty Namboze. In 2018, the musician uh, and parliamentarian Bobby Wine, here he is, uh, and four other MPs, along with dozens of their supporters, were brutally arrested, tortured, and held in incommunicado for a week. One of the victims will never walk again. Countless others have been tortured and killed, and yet Western aid from the US, UK, and Europe continues to flow in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>